So today, uh, are you able to see my screen? Is it uh, is it good enough? Or you know, I think you know, if you want, I can once in a while I can do like this. Okay. Um, yes. Thank you. So um, data has signals. You know, use that sentence. Data had has signals, right? And we are looking for some signals in terms of the hypothesis. You know, uh, whether the signal is you know, increased in the latest time period or signal is you know certain segments of the population have you know different types of signals levels of signals compared to other segments in the population uh, the fundamental question is you now how do we capture the signal analyze it interpret it okay but in order to capture these signals and analyze interpret it we need to make transformations you know because certain signals are uh, easy to uh, express and understand uh, if it is transformed in a certain uh, if it is transformed using some tra you know, central transformation function I mean, if you have to say it in from the engineering point of view you have to transform the signals in the images uh, you know for example you have to standardize it between 0 and 1 you know because the signals in the images are between 0 and 255 if you have the RG RGB coding. You know, if you have the RGB coding, it is to zero to two fifty. So as it is, it's not you know good enough to read through. So you want to standardize it between zero and one, for example. Okay, so that's a transformation you do in order to you know easily interpret the signal because you know if it is something closer to one, um, then you know uh, you know it has the highest level of uh, intensity. If it is closer to zero, lowest level. Furthermore, it may not be just you know, do, you know, it may not be just taking the maximum and minimum. You know, it is maximum minus minimum divided by I mean, the the actual value of the signal, value of the color coding RGB coding divided by the maximum minus minimum. That's what gives you the the number of, you know the, between the value between zero and one. So my point is, you know, you have to do you know, data transformations. If you want to read the signal from data, okay, and there are many you know ways to do that. Uh, some of them are purely mathematical transformations. Some of them are statistical transformations. Some of them we apply what is called the apply group of functions. That's where this apply apply r you know app apply r you know so we just say apply apply r because you know the, it resembles with r more resounds well well with r r language more. We use that, and then there is also D player and also DB player. Okay, so that is a database player. Okay, so we are going to see quickly uh, some of these things, and then DB player I will I will talk about it. You know later on, uh, they also means you know arranging the data, transforming the data, investigating the signals in the data. So if you are given a data, the fundamental question you always ask is you know where most of the data are. Okay, where most of the data are and that is what we call the location and then how much they are spread out okay that is the second part of the question you always think about in terms of in terms of the data uh, that is called the spread which is also the standard deviation range um, and you know uh, standard deviation range variance all these things you know are measures of how much they are dis dis dispersed the third type is you now how they are stacking against in terms of the frequency, right? You know, because in one place there could be a lot of data, and in another place not that much data, right? So um, that is called the stacking of the operation, right? So the three parts to it: you know, location, dispersion, and then how much it is stacking. And the stacking is what is giving you the skewness that processes all those information, whether it is, you know, whether it is stacking much higher than the normal distribution are much lower than the normal distribution. So we will always make the relative comparisons and the relative comparison is with respect to the normal distribution. So whether it is skewness or dispersion or the location, all these things we will always talk about in relation to normal distribution um, in general, but not all the time. For example, to know the location, you don't have to compare it to normal distribution. But if you want to know the, the dispersion levels as well as the Skewness and kurtosis. Skewness refers to how skewed you know the data are, and whether it is too much on the left side or too much on the right side. You know that is kind of the you know, the the uh, 
the you know skewing of the data or the other one is you know whether it is uh, stacking up too much more than bigger than uh, you know beyond the normal distribution or less than the normal distribution these are relatively will tell you the types of signal that you know you want to read through and interpret the data on top of it you know those three you know four things i said that is location dispersion please note it on these keywords right location dispersion uh, skewness and third process we also apply you know transmissions mathematical transmissions you know sometimes you want to uh, read through the signals uh, because you know you need the combinations how many combinations are represented in the data or for example a power function or somewhere or you might use an exponential function or you might use an absolute function you don't want to you, you want the signals, you know, not to be confused with the, you know, whether it's negative sign or positive sign, but just how much it is. So, the signals in the data, we need, for, in order to read the signals in the data, we need functions. And these are mathematical functions. There are also statistical functions. The, the basic statistical functions are highlight, I'm highlighting here, percentiles, interquartile range, median, mean. And here is an example code, for example, how do I get the you know percentages are you know computed in R using function called quantile? Okay, so I sometimes use you know actual data sets you know uh, to explain. For example, uh, the housing data you know it's in the Kaggle competition. The housing data I read it into you know, the data set H. So if I have head H, that means you know the header five six pack six operations. So these are all the variables in the housing data set uh, so there are something like 80 variables are there okay so it's an id here ms subclass ms zoning lot frontage lot area i mean this is about a housing data okay it's a, it's called iowa uh, ames data ames housing data it's there in the Kaggle competition whether it is the street is paved or not lot shape is regular or not irregular uh, land contour is leveled or not you know, utilities or public utilities or private, um, they may not have public, no utilities at all. Sometimes just people use some basic things, plot configuration, land slope, neighborhood uh, area, condition of the land, condition of the house, condition, of, and then building type, one family, single family, house type, two story, one story, and so on. Okay, the year built, overall condition of the house. There is a dictionary that explains these variables. Okay, so you can see it in Kaggle completion, or I can share that also. So the point here is that you know um, there are variables, the 80 plus variables, and you know we can locate, you know, find out what those variables are. I read this data set from you know usual stuff. Uh, this is one of the things that I do in the in the class, uh, which I teach you know diploma in data science. Uh, we analyze you know housing data set extensively for predictive purposes. So if, if you want to find out, I already read that data set. So I trust that you know how to read you know, CSV files. So if you just want to find out the names, there are 81 variables, including the ID variable, right? So there are really, you know, 80 variables up there, okay? Um, but the ID is not a variable, it's just an you know, identification observation. So, um, so you have the data and, uh, uh, you know, as, as I said, there are mathematical functions and statistical functions which you want to use to transform them. So here is a collection of, um, I would say, uh, essential uh, operational uh, functions are here, for example, essential operational functions. For example, append, C bind, column bind, graph, you know, we don't need to worry about this one. It's very advanced. Um, you know, checking for identicality and then length of a vector the list of uh, list of objects in a current environment, range effects. These are all the, the operational functions that we need to work in R. And then there is a collection of math functions, you know, square root sum. I, I showed you some, and here is more. Okay. Very interesting thing is you now, if uh, what is this called you now? This one percent divided percent multiplicator. Okay. And uh, and also percent O percent. These are for matrix operations. Okay. These are for matrix operations, and these are pure, simple mathematical operations. And then this is a set operation, for example. I'm not sure whether you are able to see this one. Are you able to see this one? Are you able to read these things? Just say yes or no. Or you can type. No, sir. 
No, sir, we can't able to see it now properly. Can you zoom it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So these are these are you know matrix computations. Okay. These are matrix computations. This is a set computation. And this is also matrix, but eigenvalues and eigenvectors, and some some basic you know derivative, uh, you know symbolic and algorithmic derivatives are also available in R. Okay, uh, plus the integrated integration. These are all math versions. These are basically, I would say, operational R operational keywords, you know, commands for example, get working directory, set working directory, all these things. Okay, but what is more important? That is anyway you should know that because you know. That's how you can work with R, but I would bring in this collection of you know, functions, which are the huge collection of R functions that are available for you to do the transformations in data. Okay. You want to ask anything it's here, okay, um, uh, in this collection. And so this is a good collection. I put it there in the list in my, my reference list also. Uh, for example, uh, let's just take uh, Okay, it, it won't have functions like skewness and kurtosis because for some reason, you know, um, it may be hidden in one of these packages. Um, but the thing is, you know, it is not there. It is in a special package called moment, moments package. So if you want skewness and kurtosis, you have to go to the broad package library moments. I already loaded that. Okay, you can see that it is here. Okay, moments. So I upload that one. That's where I get to you know the some of the other uh, not usually used mom, you know moments like skewness and cutters. You would imagine that they are more used, often used, right? Uh, I would I imagine more often it's used and it's part of the these common functions, but it's not there. But so you, you have to use sometimes when it's not there, you just use packages that provide that. You know? So this provides you. So if you want to find out the mean and standard deviation of the the housing sale price data, for example. This is the mean price, you know, the, the full for the whole. How many operations are there? Let's say N row H. 1,460 operations are there, right? And out for all the 1,460 operations in this training data set, you want to find out what is the average value of the price of the house. It is $180,000, $180,000.9, okay? Um, $180,000, okay? And then you want to calculate this uh, you know, variance. You can do that uh, H dollar sell price. Okay, so variance is very big because the squared operation, right? So we want to get usually you want, you want to work on the same unit of measurement. You have to put you know, the standard deviation, which is the square root of this. Okay, so it is really seventy nine eighty thousand dollars is the standard you know, standard deviation. That means you know, um, on an average, the observations are away from the mean, okay, on an average, 80,000 observations. It's an average of the of the, the distance between each of the observations to the mean of the observations, okay, that's what it is. So we can find out and use this kind of basic things to talk about and understand and interpret, right? And not only that, we have other things also, like, you know, we may need, for example, median. So if you want to find out what it is or what, you, know, you don't know how to define all this, you can check with this. As long as it is part of the basic R, you will be, you'll be able to put the question mark and you know, get the help file. So here is the help file. You will see, um, here is the help file I wanted to show you. Oh, okay, because I, I am looking at the graphics, I'm not able to, I'm, I'm not seeing that one. You have to go to the help file here, and you can ask for median here, and you can understand that way, or you can ask for in the, with the question mark here, right, like this. So either way, you can get, you know, whatever the measurement that you are talking about, or the function you want to apply, you can put a question mark with that one, if it is in the, if, if it is in the R base R, you know, it will give you those definitions. So, for example, it says median of the variable X, and then there is a condition, you know, NA remove, false or true. So, so if it doesn't have NA, if it has the NA, you want to remove that, you can put a NA dot row, RM is equal to true, okay? Then it will remove all those NAs and then calculate the values. It will affect when your denominator is, you know, the total number of operations. So, in the case of mean, it will affect. 
Okay. Um, in the case of the uh, median, it won't happen. Um, so the help file will also give you some examples here. You know, for, for example, median of the observation sequence observation one to four is here, or the collection observation one to three hundred and one thousand, or the median. You can see that here. Okay. Um, so we see all these basic measurements. You know, some of the other useful, important measurements are, for example, interquartile range. It's a very important measurement about data elements. Um, it tells you. Uh, it tells you between the third quarter and the first quarter what is the difference. Okay, so you can get the quarter. You remember I mentioned that you know quintile will give me right. Quintile will give me the data set. Let's say the the sale price, right? Sale price. I want to find out the first quarter, right? Twenty five percent. That means the first quarter. So that's the way to find out the quartiles. You know, this is uh, quintile. 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 Quantile. Okay, so 25% of the quantile, which is the first quarter, first quartile is 129,000. So if you want to do the median, which is also another way of getting the median is this way, $163,000. And if you want 73%, it is $214,000. So you can also find out Interquartile range. I'm talking about interquartile range because it is helpful to locate sometimes the outliers. Okay, uh, if you are doing some outlier analysis for single variables, you know you have to use interquartile range based outlier de definitions. So let's see this. So IQR, you just have to do the same thing. One more, please. Sorry. H dollar. We do this all the time, right? Yes. So the interquartile range is $84,025. Okay. So if you need the definition I said, you know, interquartile range, you can check it out also here. Um, you may have to go to the you know, analysis, I mean, you may have to go to the uh, reference, you know, exploratory data analysis by Tukey, or you can see the uh, the web, let's go, uh, what is it? It's going to be used, uh, it is used for outliers, so I'm going, I want to bring that information to you. So, interquartile range as it is, is as I said, the Q3 minus Q1, right? But using the interquartile Q3 minus Q1, that is quartile 3 minus quartile 1. And I'm not why this quarter one. Okay, so it is because this minus this minus this. That's what I'm saying. Okay, so you can just see check it out also. If you, um, I'm just for curious, right? Curiosity. I'm going to do that. H dollar sale price, comma point seven five. That is the third quarter. I'm going to do quantile. H dollar sale price zero point two five. Okay, so it is same. Like you know, instead of I could have done this one, right? But there is a function already available for you to have this quick calculation. Okay, now using interquartile range, you will be able to locate um, using IQR uh, locating. Outlets. Okay. How do we do that? Um, I'm not interested in these things. Just images are good enough. Uh, so here is the you know way it is outliers are defined for you. You know if you want to find out outliers, this is the way to do right. Anything less than Q1 minus 1.5 IQR or anything above Q3 plus 1.5 IQR are considered as outliers. May I make it? Everybody gets it, gets that point. Anything less than Q1, which is Q1 is quarter one, minus 1.5 times IQR, or above Q3 plus 1.5 IQR, are considered as outliers. So let's, can we find some outliers here for us? You know, um, 
we are saying um, Q, first I want to find out Q1, let's say Q1 is equal to, uh, we already know this, Q1 is this, right? I have already calculated, you know, given the formula here. But we need 1.5 calculations also, okay? Q1, Q3 is this, 7, 5. Now, IQR is, we know IQR is, which is IQR, let's say IQR, cell um, price, okay, IQR cell price is equal to uh, this one, IQR. So I got these three, quant three quantities, so what I'm saying is, you know, uh, anything less, so H, dollar sale price right sale price if the the sale price from the data set h which is a housing data set if the sale price is greater than this talking about greater than q3 plus 1.5 times iqr IQR SP is that they will be considered as outliers. So let's just calculate these values first, okay? We'll call this the upper bound, right? Upper bound. Okay, upper bound is equal to unexpected symbol. Oh, symbol. oh I see. It is not, it should be like this. Okay, so what is upper B? So it is $340,000, lower B is equal to Q1 minus 1.5 times IQR SP. Okay, what is the lower bound? Which is 3,926. So any price, house price, which is less than this is absolutely, I mean, this is, this is not a you know, highly validated collection of, you know, uh, Observation studies that tells you why it should be 1.5. You know, some expert in this case, uh, John Tukey, a very well-known statistician, yeah. figured out after a lot of analysis, he said, oh, okay, if it is Q3 plus 1.5 times IQR above that, or Q1 minus 1.5 times IQR below that, you know, these are all too far away from most of the observations from most of the observations, right? That's the definition of, um, that's the definition of uh, outliers. One thing you all have to know is that statistics is a science of about most of the observations, okay? So outliers will actually distort the conclusions. So you have to be very careful about outliers and also influential observations, all those things. But you know, just we are getting into the basics of uh, the statistical thinking, right? So. Anything less than upper bound, I'm sorry, anything above upper bound, anything less than lower bound, you can consider them as outliers. Now, if I want to see the outliers, you know, what are those records? I want to see the records in H, okay? I want to see the records in H, where H sale price, okay, is less than, um, less than lower B, okay, or H dollar sale price greater than upper B, you know, I want to see all those records, right? That's what I want to look for. Those are the outliers, you know, what, what you're saying, H out. Outliers, maybe okay. Which outliers? Let's see. Columns, undefined columns selected. Okay, so the upper bound. Um, data frame. Which? After I will get it on this. Okay. No 
Okay, you know, there are many ways to do that. I'm going to make it simpler. Um, you want to find out H dollar sale price greater than, we are going to get uh, index from here, okay? Greater than upper bound. We are going to get an index here. And then we have to feed that index to find out the records. See, these are the truth tables. So this only tells you which index falls. So this is 826 is an outlier. That's what it says. Okay. And uh, and then next outlier is you know, 991 is the next outlier. Uh, here is another 7, 7, 796, 97, 98, 99. 799 is an outlier. 801, 2, 3, 8, 804 is an outlier. So these are the conditions that tells you. So there are a lot of many outliers are here. So I'm going to do. Column selected. Oh, okay. Excuse me, the, excuse me, the, okay. So I can feed this, you know, the, the truth table into the edge table, into the edge table. I can find out actually exactly what those authors, the full record, you know, of the, the outlier that is identified by interquartile range. Okay. So um, I'll, I'll get back to that. Uh, how to identify using the which function and using the indexing, all those things. The point is, these are some of the basic functions you need. That is location, uh, dispersion, the uh, the kurtosis, the skewness and kurtosis, as well as you know, the outliers or some of the important transformations you use for uh, for for your uh, for your basic analysis of you know, where the data are distributed. So here is, for example, you know, um, I want to share with you another example. Let's say here is one. I want to open it. Uh, this data is about. Uh, this data is about uh, uh, family, children height, and you know nutrition. So, for example, if you look at it, if you look at this one, you know here is the fathers. You know, this is uh, 890 families for which you know children height is you know um, children height is here is the actual data set. Children heights are there uh, offset by 60 inches. Okay. Father's height is 60 plus 18 inches. I'm not sure whether you're already able to read this one. Mother's height is 60 plus 7 inches. Uh, the, uh, this, this is the boys. These are the girls. Okay, So the first family has one boy and three children, and three girls. Okay, The boy is 68.2 inches. Daughter is 69.1, 69.0, 69.0. So for that you know, uh, data, so I want to show you what it means, why it matters to me to analyze the location and dispersion and so on. For example, by looking at this data in this way, this is the father's height, children height. I want to see whether I can use father's height to predict the children height. It's a very simple problem. It is not enough. You may want to use mother's height also. Okay, so it is it is a more complicated, more advanced analysis. But take a look at this one. This tells me where most of the data is located, right? So it is located around the father's height, around you know, 69.2 inches, and uh, children height is most of the observations are located. Most of the observations are located here in the middle. You remember that, okay? And likewise, most of the observations are located here in the middle. So it tells you most of the observations are father's height is 16.2, children height is 66.7. But it is not only the you know the location, but also how much it is dispersed that matters, right? Children height is dispersed from anywhere from 55, 56, I'm talking about here, 56 inches to, I'm talking about almost 79 inches, right? Children height. On the other hand, father's height is 
also almost almost from 57 58 inches okay because it's five inches from here to here five inches so this can be only three inches right you know, around maybe 60 inches okay 60 inches from 60 inches to we are talking something like around 80 inches right so this gives you an uh, you know an idea about the location of the data dispersion of the data i mean right, it is not dispersed too much right really I don't want to use the word too much because I, we don't know what is going to be too much or too little, but this is how it is distributed, dispersed and distributed. Okay. This particular graph is to understand is there any relationship between father's side and children? Side? And you can see that you know the data is moving all the way from here, here to here, here, more and more. As more and more data comes in, there is a it's a slanting relationship is there. That means you know if I capture it in a line form, it is this relationship. So it says you know, it has a, some kind of, a, you know, it can be somewhat linearly, linearly represented. Uh, the children height can be linearly represented by father side. That's what this means. Okay. So remember, statistics is all about mostly most of the data and it is about the most, um, uh, most information you can get about it. Okay. That is, it's not a perfect science. Statistics is not a perfect science. You know, if you want to go to the perfect science, you have to work with math. Mathematics. Mathematics is coming here in statistics also, but it is all it's always about what does the most of the data tell us as a story. Most of the data tell us as a story. Okay. And sometimes you have to remove the, the outliers, removing outliers is one such example. So um, in a, you know, in an advanced sense, you know, we talk about you know the conditional expectation you know, of the means will lie on this line and so on and so forth. So that's what the linear models or regression models are about. You know, I'm not uh, here to talk about that for now. But you can see here another example, you know, using a box plot. See, that's another thing you have to, you know, basic things I would say, you know, know about the box plot, which is about five important measurements. The um, first quartile, median, third quartile. Okay, sometimes mean is also used. And then the, you know, the, uh, the bounds. Okay, the bounds are, uh, the bounds beyond, above that is considered as outlier, below that is considered as outlier. You know, that bounds is really the uh, Q1 minus 1.5 IQR. This is Q3 plus 1.5 IQR. Okay, so Q1 minus 1.5 IQR, first quarter, two points, median, three points, third quarter, fourth point, and fifth point is uh, the Q3 plus IQR, 1.5 times IQR. So these are five points that determines the box plot. Very basic information because using that, you can figure out that this is an outlier in the data. This is an outlier in the data. So we are doing this, you know, for conditional heights. You know, given a specific height of the father, we are plotting that distribution, okay? And uh, this is two points or outliers, in the, you know, for, the, for all the fathers who have 65 plus 65.5, uh, you know, heights, you know, we have multiple fathers with the height. These are two outliers, okay? So, and again, this one outlier here, there's an outlier here, there's an outlier here, there's an outlier here. So, it is important to know the outliers are not influencing your data, your conclusions. So, you need to identify that. So, there are some codes here how you can get this, um, how you can get this graph. Uh, you know, the, this code will help you out, you know, with this kind of graph. Um, which is basically a box plot, by, but then you you do that by main x line, father side. Height is a function of fathers. Well, height means the children height really. Children height is a function of father side, and data is g. The main data, you know, this is just a this title here. Main title is this Galton data. X lab is fathers. This is father side. That is the x label. Y label is children height. Okay, so because we put this condition height as a function of father, so for every data point, we have multiple fathers, so that's why it is giving you multiple, automatically multiple box plots, okay. So what I'm trying to tell you is that, you know, you have to think about where most of the data are located, how they are spread out. You can see the spread of spread in here, right? This, these are all another way of, you know, finding out the spread of the data, right? The, this is the one point, the boundary points. Before, below that is a considered as outlier, and the another boundary point, upper boundary point, above that is considered as outlier, and then in between the Q1, Q3, this is the Q1, this is the Q3, and this is the median, 
this is you know is a, another way of checking out the how much they are dispersed you can see there is very little dispersion here maybe not many data points are there okay very little dispersion is here okay but uh, but then you can you see you can see that a lot more dispersion here a lot more dispersion is there it should give you some thinking about you know how to interpret the data how to con you know how to convince how to defend your conclusions okay the conclusions are in this case particular example there is a relationship between father's height and children's height you know because you can see that you now it is it, 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 these are conditional means these conditional means these are open no, conditional medians okay these are conditional medians and these conditional medians are increasing as the age increases father's i'm sorry father's height increases so let's keep going you know very important i i, I got so much to do let's let's move on here the interesting thing uh, another interesting thing about you know transmissions and data analysis is that you know um we want to apply a certain collection of uh, you know um a certain collection of functions because they are the most commonly used functions and i would say this is what is also called a syntactic sugar coding okay uh, method this is a common terminal that people use it and very popularly known from python side of the world but R has its own plus and beautiful uh, syntactic sugars, which is very helpful for coding purposes. Very, it simplifies it. It is elegant and it simplifies and it is fast. So, um, what you would think otherwise is a complex computation can be achieved using some of those, you know, uh, syntactic sugar codings. Okay. So, in order to do, execute that, R has also created what is called the tidyverse package because most of the most of the work you do in data analysis is that you will end up doing a visualization right you will doing some kind of a missing value imputations you will be doing you know always working with you know what is called the data frame which is a combination of quantitative data and the qualitative data you know data frame is something where columns of data are combined together where the columns could be of different types of data one could be quantitative data like age income height weight and so on on the other hand, it could also combine with a qualitative data. For example, the region, you know, somebody lives or whether they have you know, the number of children, you know, whether it is it is more than three or less than three or no children versus children, um, whether they are, you know, high income family or low income family. These are all the qualitative variables. So data frames helps us to keep things together and still work with them because that's the kind of data statisticians use. Okay. What Tibble does is that, you know, you know, there are some issues about data frames. For example, it will automatically read the characters as strings and we don't want that, you know. So uh, that kind of simple simplicity and also, you know, we want rows to be observations, columns to be attributes or variables, okay. So these things are well managed in table, you know, it's, it's really a table, you know, it's written as Tibble, Tibble. Um, so that is a package that allows, you know, making sure that the data are put together in a very structured form. That means rows are observations, columns are attributes. So we need ggplot visualization. We need missing value imputation. We need an organizing package, which, you know, creates it into a structured data set, uh, as well as a set data frame. And then it tidy up, you know, um, the data in terms of, you know, um, arranging them in such a way that it's easy to implement computational steps and then handle uh, string data and then read and write data and some kind of a forecasts. You know, it calls this as forecasts. You know. um, that these are the collection of activities you do in a data analysis. And you know, Hadley Wickham, one of the I would say, you know, um, superstars in R, right? Because he is he has done so much contribution to R. He has, you know, created uh, through his organization, you know, he, he has more and more people working for him because he has been working in this area for a long time. Um, he has contributed so much and he also contributed, you know, this fact with Tidyverse. The purpose is to bring together all the relevant things for simple data analysis. And I want to include DeepLayer also here. This is very important. It, it transforms, selects, filters, summarizes, and arranges the variables and so on. So it's a very such a very simple functional functional activities you need to do, and Deep Layer package does that for you. And Tibble is the you know arranging it into a data frame, 
for it to do the imputations and visualization. So if you do library this, you are you are working with some other basic things that you need to do the data analysis. Okay. And because filter is also available in stats package, it will, uh, you know, there are some conflicts, but then it will mask, it will remove the reference to this one when you call in dplyr. Okay. And also there is a lag function available in stats as well as dplyr. So when you call in the library tidyverse, it will automatically mask the uh, stats package lag, lag function because it should not contradict, right? So dplyr allows pipe. And the other thing is the beauty of, you know, this is where I'm, I'm talking about more and more the simplicity of the code, syntactic sugar of the code is that, you know, dplyr allows piping of commands. I'm going to show you something about it. Reducing wastage of resources and keeping the continuity of data flow. So from one step to another step to another step to another step, you know, you don't want to think about, you know, oh, what I did, what I did not do, because the, you know, with the piping commands, if we are able to do step one, step two, step three, step four, and then eventually from step one to step 10, the output that you want, you will get it. No interference in between. So you know, it's a clean code. It's executed sequentially correctly, and you got the results what you wanted, which you can interpret it in a consistent way, okay? So that is what deployed does. So in the collection of these packages, you can do wonders with you know, R, okay? R, R life is easy. You know, even further, I, I, I want to I want to bring another point to the the, the syntactic sugaring code, sugar coding of the R is the idea that there is a collection of apply functions. You know, they are called apply because um, you know we, we are going to different types of ap application of the functions. Um, you know, apply is one of them. Uh, it refers to array apply apply function, array apply functions. This L refers to list apply functions. It's an application of a function, okay? And this refers to simplifying the yeah, no, L apply output. Uh, this one refers to applying uh, to subsets of vectors defined by a factor, okay? So the factor here is Y. So we are applying to the data, data X, the, you know, by the factors, the function, uh, whatever the function that we say. For example, it could be as simple as sum or maximum, minimum, uh, standard deviation, and so on, okay? Now, uh, there, are, there is also another function called m apply, which is the, uh, the multivariate apply, you know, so, which means it will take elements from a, a data set and apply it to the first elements and the, the next elements in a row or a column and so on, okay? So that's called multivariate apply functions. It's really, uh, it's not just, you know, the, the, these, these indexes refer to here, the, you know, row index or column index. If it's a matrix, it's a row index or column index. If it's an array, it is going to be, you know, which dimension is re referring to. You know, I'm going to show you some examples momentarily. So here is an example. So what I'm saying is, you know, these are all important. Why is it important? You are going to apply a function to the margins or to the members. Margin or members, you know, this is for members margin or members um, are uh, by factors. So you want to apply functions, that's why you know, very fast, very simple reports are created using the apply function. If, if it is an array, you use the app apply. If it is a list, you, you say L apply. If it is a list, output is simplified into a, what is called the atomic vector. Then you say S apply, which is the same thing as L apply, but the output becomes as simplified atomic, atomic vector. And then T apply refers to apply function to subsets of vectors defined by Y here. So if let's take an example here. For example, I just created data, okay, uh, 30 observations from a random normal uh, distribution, normal distribution, random values, 30 values, adding them to a matrix level. That's what this one is, okay. When I run that one, I got this one. Suppose I want this, you know, the sum of these by the columns here, okay. Then this is the command you use. Well, and I use this apply function, not you know, anything else, because I want to retain the structure of the data. And so uh, then and I, I just need the output, you know, this is the output I want, okay. That's all I need it by the columns. So you say this is the index, column, two means by columns, one means by row. I'm just summing them. So if you sum these values, you'll get this one. If you sum these values, you'll get this one. You can quickly check, oh, this is the biggest negative value. That's because every one of the operations is negative, right? So that's what it means. 
So it, but remember, A can be an array. It doesn't have to be a matrix, right? Now I have a matrix, but it can be an array. That means multi-dimensional, you know, matrices. It could be four-dimensional, three-dimensional, ten-dimensional. It doesn't matter. But by using the right index, you will be summarizing by that index alone. So here, I'm just going to say to here that suppose I want, let's say, I have, a, I have a, you know, uh, you know, I got 200 stores. Right. Let's say 100 stores uh, um, in three regions. So I will call it as regions. Okay. State out. No. So in 20 states. Okay. 250 stores. And each store has, let's say, 4,000 SKUs. That means you know 4,000 different products they are selling. Okay. SKUs. And uh, we have. Uh, let's say SKUs are there, and then we have um, the targeted, you know, marketing is done using, let's say, uh, five segments, okay? And then we have 10 campaigns. So if I have this kind of data set, you know, this is an array with, you know, five dimensional array, okay? So first, let's call it the first dimension is state, second dimension is stores, third dimension is SKUs, fourth dimension is segments, and a fifth dimension is campaigns, okay? And I have the results, right? So let's say um, the campaign results, right? The, um, the uh, purchases in the last month. This is a data set, okay? In the last month. So it has a five dimensional array. And purchase is the measurement that we are interested in. Suppose I want to summarize by states, okay? For each of the states I want to summarize, then I will put here one. If I want to summarize by the segments, I'll put here four. That's what I'm saying. Everybody understands that, right? Um, so let's see. You know, let's see an example here. So here is an example three dimensional array. I created a three dimensional array. Uh, one moment, please. I created a three dimensional array. So, uh, I, you, I, I used these numbers, right? I, I'm taking samples from 1 to 5 and 24, right? Sequence of 1 to 20, 1 to 5. Um, among the sequence of one to five, I'm taking 24 samples and then I'm replacing by replacement is true. Okay. That's the sampling method. So I'm creating using that data. I'm creating how many values I will have. I will have 24 values because I'm sampling 24 times. I'm re I'm putting them into a, uh, into a three dimensional array. Okay. So in the three dimensional array, by using this condition, dimension is equal to C3, comma two, comma four, I am creating four matrices. Each one is a three by two matrix. That's what this means. Four matrices. Each one is created. You know, each one is a three by two matrices. So, and I can see you know what it is. And what I'm trying to say here is that you no, know, if I want to sum, you know, find the maximum of those four matrices for each of the four matrices, I want to find the maximum. This is the condition. That is, I take the data set that is defined here, V, which has a dimension. This dimension. Third in the third dimension, which means um, for the third dimension, that means for each of the matrices, there are four matrices, right? For each of the matrices, I'm finding maximum value. That's what this one is. And I, on the other hand, if I you know I can do all kinds of you know um, all kinds of uh, function application, I can use apply summary. Summary is a function, okay? Range. I can do range, for example. I can do all kinds of things. And what many, how many types of things I can do? That's what this means. Okay, I go back now. To this one, you can apply any collection of these functions. You know, pretty much you can use once again. Pretty much you can use any collection of these functions. And how many you have? Come on, you have so many of them. Okay, pretty much. I mean, because some of them may not be applicable, so don't worry about it. But there is a large collection of application of functions you can do, and that's why I call it as a syntactic sugar because it suddenly clicks that oh my goodness, I can do so much with such a simple code. Are you guys with me? I've been talking. Just tell me. Rahul, Brian, and Paul. Yes, sir. 
Okay, good. Yes, sir. I'm with you. Yes. Sir. How about Brian Howard Raghun? Why I say this is a synthetic, synthetic sugar coating? Simple, easy, fast, elegant. Okay. All right. You can also type. All right. So we have, you know, we have those, and those those things can be applied by factors. Look at this one. I use the t-apply function to do the com computation of the functional functions for the data set x okay by the factor or it could be simply a list i have a list i can apply so let's take quickly another example here is another example uh, l apply right objects could be data frames lists or uh, vectors okay um, the, this is a little bit advanced right? so i want to skip this one because you know you can look at this one there is strange selection of this kind of functions okay functions are there so you know it's advanced for now so don't worry about it um so well what what have i achieved so far i have achieved to impress on you that r provides very simple elegant syntactic sugar code sugar coding cod secret sugar codes in r which will accomplish the fast simplified computations of very complex uh, data that you may think about but the complexity here is that it is still a structured data set. That means rows are observations, columns are attributes or variables. Now, um, the other part I want to share with you is what is called, you know, you, when you do the, these computations, you want to split the data into subsets, compute, and then combine them. If this is another thing you want to do, you know, it's called split apply, split apply combine, okay, split apply combine operation you want to do okay most of the time you will end up doing that so here is the sale the the, uh, the housing data set i have and then we are working about the you know, sale price the house sale price um, but we want to there is also called aggregate function this is the earliest and this is the very foundational level and we use this later on in the very sophisticated you know, applications in the case of summarized function okay we will come to that aggregate is another important function you can do the aggregation Aggregate does, and doesn't mean just a sum or mean, but it, you know, again, the function could be any number of functions we are talking about. The mass collection of functions that we talk about, right? So, aggregate is a function you can use. I'm taking the sale price. I'm going to do the basement finished type as a category. As a category, I want to you know, group that, that sale data by that and then do the mean values. And this is what it is. The sale in the basement, you know, Type, you know, finished type is ALQ, BLQ, GLQ, LWQ, REC, and then unfinished. Okay, so these are all the meanings are there. You know, I can give you that, uh, you know, data dictionary for you. And you can see that, you know, they do differ, you know, the, the sale, average sale price differs, and the maximum sale price is here, $233,000. That is for GLQ, whatever that means. Okay, so, but the point here is that, you know, you can do so quickly, so well, so beautifully. And it is not just a mean, I'm telling you the hundreds of functions are there, okay? And uh, uh, this aggregation uh, using the function by the group by is amazing. You can do a lot of wonders there. And here is an example. I want to show it to you that the sale price, you know, I can plot it also. You do all these things and then plot it in what is called the piping of command. That's the next syntactic sugar coding for uh, in R, okay? That is a piping of the command. So let's do, do a quick, um, there's a lot of data here. I, know, I, have to, I have it in the notes, but let's take this example, you know, uh, this is my last example. So take a look at this one, okay? Are you able to see this now? I take the data, this is the data about, you know, the, uh, the um, baseball data, and I want to group that this is another way, right? I said, uh, this, is, this is called piping, okay? Uh, I take the data and then I pipe, you know, go to the next command that is called group the data by the column variable the LGID. And you can see LGID is this one. It says the IAA, right? LGID here. So group by that one and summarize it. But in the summary, what am I trying to do? Only just a mean, you know, mean run, okay? Mean run. It's a baseball runs, okay? Mean run. And then what do I do? I take the mean runs by the group ID, these group IDs. And then I plot, do the ggplot for that. Okay, that's what this command means. So I know I cannot you know, make an error if I do this kind of 
typing of the commands, you know, the commands are going smoothly, the data is flowing smoothly from one level to another level to another level to another level, and then I get the output what I want. You cannot go wrong, you cannot make mistakes, right? You make some data set, somewhere you create there. This has happened a lot in my life, right? When I was doing, when I was a younger programmer, um, you know, you say create, uh, you will say this is the final data set, and then you will say no, this is not enough, and then I will say final one, final two, final, 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 all those things, funny things will happen, right? So you don't do that. You can, you can, you can keep this data flow very smoothly, very nicely, and this is another beautiful syntactic sugar coding for us to manage the process, data flow process. So when I do that. Um, oh, when I do that, um, you know, it works out very, you know, smoothly, simply, and without any error. That's a point of privacy. So, if I do, for example, this one, you can see that in R, I already loaded the data set, whatever the data data refers to. For me, the uh, it refers to the uh, it refers to the the, the batting data set okay so you can see that by clicking here just clicking on the data i'll just finish it in one minute okay so here is the data so that is that's what the data is okay so i want to group this by this it's not not available for all the data all the all the all the records it's you know 104,000 records are there so I group them by that and then plot it. So let's just do that and see. Okay, there you go. So here you are seeing the average run, home runs by uh, various baseball leagues. Yeah, yeah, the maximum is attained by AL. The next one is AML. So the kind of flow, uh, into the data flow is managed well with this beautiful, uh, you know, syntactic uh, sugar coding by in R okay which is a piping up command and you can use i will close this session with this statement you can use all these things whether it is a small data set or you are getting data from databases huge collection of data that you will get from databases and that's where you use what is called the db player okay db player that is database player so i want to stop here and next week you know we will review this again but then we will go into actually the more uh, statistical uh, you know, nature, computational steps, like what, what do I mean by that? You know, let's review the next week. And my apologies, I missed you guys, you know, because I had to go to India, you know, I had a personal loss. And um, I, uh, uh, I wasn't here in USA also, okay? So next week, yeah, what is that? Let me, let me yes. hear. I'll stop here momentarily, Goshali, okay? Just give me a moment. I shouldn't do this, but I want to tell you that you know, next next week we will do you know strings and dates. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Gaushal. Yes. Sir.